Tyler Dabrowski. I'm the Associate Artistic Director here at Trinity Rep. Uh, thank you so much for coming out. Um, we're here to talk a little bit about Veronica Meadows, uh, our world premiere show that uh, just opened last night. Uh, this is a salon uh, uh, talking about girl power, uh, the uh, uh, female detective in American literature and her impact on American culture. Uh, and to talk a little bit about that uh, is the playwright of Veronica Meadows, one of our acting company members, Stephen Thorne. Um, uh, also, Susan Smolian, who is a, a professor of American studies at Brown University. And then, yeah, please. She's already said like seven things that I thought were incredibly interesting. So, certainly, <laughs> she uh, And then, Christina Bevilacqua brought up the uh, problem. <laughs> And Christina is our moderator for this evening, and I couldn't ask for a, a better moderator. Uh, so I will pass the baton to you, Christina. And as usual, I have nothing to say. <laughs> 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 oh, <laughs> I promise you. Uh, uh, thank you all for coming. And um, I uh, just wanted to check and see how many people have seen the play at this point. Oh, good. And how many have plans to see it? Oh, excellent. Okay, good. Um, so I guess we'll, well, I don't know how much we'll give away. You might have to close your ears. There might That's be okay. That's okay. Um, so I thought we could just start by asking um, Susan to give us a little primer um, on the history of the girl detective, and particularly Nancy Drew, who is a big um, influence on this play. And uh, that way, those of you who did not grow up avidly reading Nancy Drew will have a little bit of background. Mostly because Christina admits not to be Nancy. No, I did. I did. No, I did. You just didn't like it. <laughs> no, we'll get into that okay. later. <laughs> I have some notes. Don't get scared. It's mostly to make sure that I don't talk too long. Um, so I wanted to talk about Nancy Drew, uh, who's maybe the beginning of the girl detectives. Um, I think this, this story, the story of Nancy Drew, uh, begins in a huge wave of children's books in the mid-19th century, um, which in some ways signals a new way of thinking about childhood at that time. It's a time set apart from grown-ups, um, that children have their own interests that won't be grown-up interests. Before this, there weren't really children's books like that, because people thought of children as just miniature adults. They would read the same stuff, maybe a little simpler, but, but they wouldn't have their separate interests. It's also a time when printing became cheaper. Um, there are more books available to the average reader, and you know this um, in some ways. The, the shorthand for this is that the books were called dime novels. Um, so they were cheap, and they were available um, to, to average folks. You didn't have to be rich to buy a book in the middle of the 19th century. So Nancy's story begins in New Jersey, as all good stories do, I think, um, with a guy named Edward Stratemeyer, who, uh, who was born in 1862. My father says I'm the kind of historian who doesn't care about dates except on Saturday night. Uh, but I'll give you a couple of dates for those of you who are the other kind of historian. Um, Stratemeyer worked in his father and then his brother's tobacco store, but he came from a long line of entrepreneurs. And he started to write dime novels. He even ghost wrote Horatio Alger's last book. Um, and he branched out pretty quickly on his own and developed what was called at the time a syndicate. Um, he outlined the novels, and then he paid anonymous uh, writers to do the writing. And he sold the novels to publishers, so he's kind of a middle guy. Stratemeyer's first series in 1899 was The Rover Boys. And then he went on to do The Hardy Boys, The Bobsy Twins, and Five Little Peppers. Those are the ones I read. He did a million other ones, the ones I happened to read. Um, and then Nancy Drew. He, uh, Stratemeyer died in 1930, but his daughters took over the business and his secretary. Uh, and kept it going until um, 1984. Um, most of Stratemeyer's writers were journalists, uh, as was a woman named Mildred Wirt Brent Benson, who was born in 1905, and she was the first Carolyn Keene, the name that was given to the author of Nancy Drews. So um, Mildred Wirt Benson. Benson first wrote a series called Ruth Fielding, and then she was invited to write Nancy Drew. And there were three that came out right at the beginning um, uh, in 1930. Uh, Stratemeyer thought you should uh, put out groups of books and build the excitement. It's a little like binge watching, um, it's binge reading. Um, there was The Secret of the Old Clock, The Hidden Staircase, and The Bungalow Mystery. Uh, Benson wrote 23 others until 1948. Um, 
Benson says uh, his instructions were to end each chapter with cliffhanging suspense and to include several paragraphs promoting other proposed books in the series. <laughs> Otherwise, I was on my own. Now, that ended a bit when the syndicate was taken over by Stratemeyer's daughter, Harriet Stratemeyer Adams, and she took more control over the stories. Um, and so somewhere um, 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 in the, in the mid 40s, no, somewhere in the 30s even, um, uh, he died just as the first Nancy Drews came out. Um, Benson continued to write some, and then um, uh, Harriet um, Stratemeyer Adams decided that the, the, the stories were not um, uh, appealing enough, and so she insisted that the authors, and there were at that point others besides Benson, um, that had a boyfriend, um, that there would be a housekeeper, a sort of mother figure that Nancy hadn't had, and that, she, that Nancy had friends, and these were her cousins, uh, George, who is always described as a tomboy, and my colleagues in cultural studies would now read as the queer figure uh, in, in the Nancy Drew books, and I think she truth is. Um, and Bess, who's more clothes-loving, more traditionally feminine. So Nancy had, they, Bess and George were, were cousins of were Nancy's sidekicks. So um, Adams, uh, um, the, the Stratemeyer's daughter, wrote a bunch of the books until her death in 1982. She kept all the other authors secret. No one learned about Benson until 1993 when they had a conference at the University of Iowa where she was a journalism alum and they sort of brought her back. Uh, and, and she was alive and, and went to the conference and she wrote hundreds of other books. These were like 23 of the ones she wrote. She wrote hundreds, but these are the ones that made her famous. Um, Harriet Adams also began revising the books and updating the books starting in 1959, but as you can see, there had been revisions right from the beginning. By 1977, all the original volumes had been revised or rewritten, mostly, they say, to make Nancy more feminine, closer to Bess than to George, and to give her boyfriend Ned uh, a bigger uh, role. The, the revisions continue. I bought my latest copy of Nancy Drew for a dollar at Ocean State Job Lots. Um, <laughs> Uh, the book is called Dress to Steal. Nancy drives a hybrid, not a roadster. <laughs> she does more shopping than, um, than, than detecting, if you ask me, but that's just maybe a you know, bitter second wave feminist talking. <laughs> uh, um, she, by 2002 estimate, there were 200 million copies sold. Um, Simon and Schuster bought the series at one, at one point. They brought out something called the Nancy Drew Files, which was for older kids. The super mysteries, which the graduate students in my department is what they read, were the super mysteries. So they're in their 20s. Um, those were collaborations between Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys that started in 1988. There were like six of those. Their Nancy Drew notebooks came out for second to fourth graders in 1994. There's a there's a. Um, a video, uh, you know, a digital game, an online game, of course. Uh, beginning in the 1990s, Applewood Books published facsimile editions of early Nancy Drew. Um, in, indeed, Sarah Paretsky, the famous mystery writer, uh, writes the intro to The Secret of the Old Clock, uh, which is one of the first ones. And, and you can get those still uh, from Applewood Books. Now, second wave feminists remember these early Nancy Drew books fondly. One literature professor writes, Nancy Drew could do anything and never took no for an answer. Um, she was adventuresome and matter of fact and relied completely on herself. She was powerful, the opposite of me, and she showed me what I wanted to be. After all, what girl actually got to rescue her own father, held hostage by criminals? But this is exactly what Nancy did at the climax of The Hidden Staircase. As Benson once said, I made her good-looking, smart, and a perfectionist. I made her a concept of the girl I'd like to be. So there's one reading where the early Nancy Drew books published before World War II are more feminist, more about a strong young woman, and then the books get watered down. I haven't had time to go back and reread the originals, and I can't remember which ones I read. Uh, I was saying my mother was very cheap, so I, we got it from the library, but we never bought books. And so I, I, I may well have read the originals. I, I don't know. I started in the early 60s. But I wonder if our nostalgia has made Nancy more feminist than she was. We needed a role model, and there she was. Um, certainly we can see her legacy in the more current girl detectives. My favorite is Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but Shirley Stevens' uh, inspiration, Veronica Mars. Um, at me, I think the other young adult uh, series have girl warriors. I always think of them as Title IX heroines, uh, those active <laughs> sports girls. And the girl detectives um, are, are not the same. So, I, for example, I, the, the girl warriors are like the Hunger Games. 
they're different, uh, if you ask me. I like Nancy Drew because she was smart uh, and beautiful and brave. The Warriors put brave first in that list. And I, I like Nancy Drew because she was always thinking, trying to figure out how to solve the mystery. So, um, and I think, unlike the girl warriors, these, um, these girl detectives have a slightly longer history and more interesting backstory. So that's why I like Nancy Drew. <laughs> there will not be a test. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I want to now ask Stephen how the uh, bright eyed girl with no doubts became your muse. Yeah, absolutely. I should have called you first. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, um, they pay me to do this. <laughs> <laughs> that's my job. That's really, that's, that's, that was, that's really fantastic. Well, I, um, I thought it was a fun idea, quite honestly. It sounded like an exciting idea, and, and something that I really honestly knew nothing of. My sister read all the books. I never read any of them. I would look at the covers. And I'd go, wow, that looks really great when I'm reading. Um, uh, I thought it, it would be a fun idea. Uh, about 12 or 13 years ago, we, we took a, a production here called the Ruby Sunrise down to Actors Theater of Louisville uh, for the Humana Festival. And uh, several company members went down with that show. And we were down there for four or five weeks. We had a lot of time on our hands. And I was staying in this bizarre uh, place that they put us up. It had like four bedrooms, and it was like no furniture. It was like, like the 13th floor of this building in this weird part of town. So it was this very strange place. And I had all this time on my hands and no money and no car. And I, for some reason, I don't even really know why, I just started sort of writing down uh, scenes and things and it involved this girl detective character who at the time I decided to name her Vivian Meadows. Um, I'll, I can say more about that a, a later. And it really, you know, I just scribbled and scribbled and scribbled. I didn't even really know what I was doing. I was just kind of having fun. And then I basically put it in a, a drawer for a long time. Um, after I finished working on the Poe play that we produced here a couple of years ago, I really wanted to try to write something else because uh, I had such a great experience developing it here with the company and I thought I'd really like to try to take advantage of that and see how I can improve on that and also get better as a writer and, and, uh, and uh, well, I had no idea that it would, it would actually you know, come to fruition. I thought at least I should try to write a play. I don't know if I'll be able to do another one. Um, and I was sort of think, trying to think about what to write about and uh, of course nothing came to mind so then I just started looking through these old files, and I came across these things, and, and um, some of them were, were I, I, I was smiling and kind of, oh, that's kind of fun, and I was like, what's that? I don't know what that is. Uh, and then I, uh, it just kind of stayed with me, so I thought, well, let me just play around with this a little bit more. So I basically threw all that old stuff out, because it was, it was just kind of crazy. Um, and I just sort of started writing a couple of scenes, which actually turned out to be the first two scenes of this play, and I thought, well, that's really interesting, but is this a play? I mean, is this just kind of me thinking that a girl detective is kind of cool and fun? Like, what, what would be a dramatic kind of thing to actually chew on? And then I, at that point, I sort of just really said, I, if I'm going to have a girl detective or even try to write about a girl detective, I should read some girl detective books. That would be a useful thing. And so I did. I actually didn't read a lot of them because as much as I love them, they're... Because you don't have to. You know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, you kind of get the gist. And I also wanted to, to start by kind of just using my my imagination saying, well, what, what, would, what would be in one of those books? And it turns out that most of us can kind of guess at what are in, in those books. I don't know how that happens either through because they just became this kind of icon in our, you know, in our culture that, that everyone could probably sit down and write about 15 things that happened and more that happened in one of these books. Or, or oh, it's probably got a character of this, you know, the old, uh, the father figure or the best friend or, the, you know, uh, so-and-so. Um, so I, I sort of came up with my version and then was reading, reading the books uh, about it, um, which, which were interesting. And, um, as I was doing research, I came across a series with a character called Judy Bolton, written by a woman, Margaret, Margaret Sutton. Um, and in her books, she actually has her character age, mm -hmm. um, technically age. She does get older and she gets married and does have children. I, I, I read the first two books of that series and I jumped right to the one where they got married because I thought, wow, I want to see what's going to happen. I'm like, what is she, how is she going to handle this? And it's like, it's as if nothing happened. I mean, it's, it's like this mentioned, they got married and went, walked in the door and 
there's no mention of like what their life was like, what the romance, anything like that. I mean, they love each other, obviously. But, but it was as if you could just feel the format of the book was... Yeah, exactly. There was, it was just like, we're not deviating from the plan here. Just, this is a fact in life that she is married and she's continuing to solve mysteries. And, and, and around that time, I, I, I thought, well, that's really intriguing. Because, you know, Nancy Drew and many of these others, they can't grow up, they can't get older because the series would end. So I thought, well, what would happen if they did? Or, or you know, or, or were thrust into situations that were outside of the scope of what they're able to do. It, it's true that they are independent and heroic and able to do so many things and not become attached to Ned Nickerson or whoever. You know, they're free to sort of be unattached. Um, but they're not free to grow up and they're not free to kind of say, you know what I really want to do is pack a gun. Uh, uh, and thank goodness, I mean, thank goodness, but, but that, that started to assemble in my brain as a possible kind of dramatic thing to kind of explore. What would happen if that character moves into a, a, a world that, that is more difficult and doesn't have, uh, where the end of the book is not, oh, look at this, a mysterious clue has just arrived on my doorstep, and now the next mystery has made itself completely known to me. Um, as, my, as satisfying as it is, I think that's another part of why those books are popular. It, there's an incredible satisfaction in completing uh, an adventure or a journey, you know what I mean? I, 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 we all feel that in life when we like get something done or complete something. I mean, I, in my job, it is, I'm incredibly lucky that you know, we work on a play for three months and then it ends. And even with the ones that you love and you're sad to see it go away, there's something so kind of refreshing, naturally refreshing about that. And then starting on something new. Um, and that, that feeling of satisfaction uh, is, is I, I would guess, I'm making this up right now, is a big part of what makes those, those books readable. Why you can jump into reading the next ones. Why series television is, is, is popular as it is, as you say. And, and with a cliffhanger, it's like, oh my god, wait, let's just watch one more. Let's just see what happens. I want to see what happens. Um, so that's the that's sort of how I came to write the play. So um, you've both alluded to this idea of her, of the girl detective as um, having um, a kind of con she has a control over her environment that is I think akin to what you were just talking about. It's yeah. in you know when in life we don't often feel like we have we can control everything, but she does control her environment. Um, I should just, I just want to add also that Susan referred earlier to the fact that I didn't like Nancy Drew. It's not that I didn't like Nancy Drew, but I was thinking about why was it in thinking about this, um, the play and, and doing this um, conversation tonight, I read her really, really avidly and for a period of probably about four years, um, between nine and 12 or 13, maybe into 13. And, but I don't remember feeling like she was really, I liked the mysteries and I liked that we were always fighting over who got the next book. And somehow also, I don't understand, you might be able to explain the publishing history of this. When I was reading them, we would, always only one of us in our group of friends had the latest one. It was like, I mean, I know we were pre-internet, it was like we were pre-publishing. Yeah. Like somehow there was one manuscript. And then, and you know, we, looked, we were sort of middle class girls, like our parents went to bookstores, but somehow there was only ever one in the town. And I remember there was this whole thing that if somebody's birthday was happening, you would try to be the one to give her the book for her birthday because then you would be the first one that got to borrow it. So anyway, there were, so, so there was this whole sort of elaborate, so I loved all that about it, but I was trying to think like, why do I not remember her particularly being um, um, ex exciting or, or she didn't seem to me like a, I guess she seemed independent, but her life seemed kind of boring. And then I, I last night suddenly thought, I read her between 1968 and 1972. So, you know, the Vietnam War, the assassination of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy, Watergate, the ERA, um, the Kent State Massacre. I mean, life was pretty exciting between 1968 and 1972. And I don't think I felt like Nancy and her roadster could have really solved any of that. So I think I <laughs> thought that she was kind of comforting. Like, you know, I. Well, where did she live again? River, Riverdale? Riverdale. Riverdale seemed kind of appealing in a boring sort of way. Um, that, uh, so, but, uh, but again, you know, I, when Susan and I first started talking the other day and talking about, you know, I was thinking, well, that moment was one where girls were sort of breaking out and doing all these things, and as she pointed out, well, they were in the 30s too, you know, there are these waves, and so it's interesting to think about 
what version of Nancy we read, but also when we read whichever version of Nancy would also sort of affect how we thought about her. But in any event, um, this, somebody, uh, there was a scholar who wrote that um, one of the things that, uh, is that she solved, Nancy Drew solved the contradiction of competing discourses about American womanhood by entertaining them all. And that seemed really accurate to me, and I think that's really captured in the play. And I wondered if you might talk a little bit about that, and then you might as well. Go ahead. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I, I do think that all popular, I just help. Yeah, I've been mean to this. Please, oh, come on. Uh, but I think all, um, all popular culture, um, succeeds because it's, and the fancy people would say polysemic, because it has every message impossible. That's why it's popular, because lots of people can go to it and find something that they are interested in. So, and this is a sort of classic women's issue as well, that women are portrayed in popular culture in every possible way, um, in so many different guises that no one person could manage that. So my colleagues at Michigan, Susan Douglas, um, has a, a book out called Enlightened Sexism, which compares the, 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 the poor pictures of women in her, in her daughters, um, in the um, popular culture aimed at her daughter, and that aimed it at her, um, and says that both of them tell us the story that, that, that feminism is over, that we don't need it anymore, um, that it, you, know, you can be flirty and fun and Miley Cyrus and, and still be a feminist, or you can be uh, powerful and in charge of the law and order you know, precinct. And, you know, but, but in either case, don't worry, be happy. We've, all, we've figured this all out, and we're all feminists. We're all liberated together. And her point is neither one, that both that, that popular culture shows us um, beyond what we've got. Well, that not quite, it says, it's not, it's not quite what you were asking. No, I, I mean, I'm, I'm asking probably a lot of things, and I think it was hard to actually, um, the, the play, which I saw twice over the weekend, and, um, and I recommend that, um, uh, because it was, there were resonances the second time around that I, you know, that made it, made me think about it all the more, but I think that part of what's, what is difficult is, it's a play about ambiguity in many ways. It's about aging, this, this was sort of what I came up with today. It's about aging, how we come to be able to appreciate or experience ambiguity as we age, because that's, I mean, she starts out very, it's black and white, she's yeah. sure about everything. Um, and the cost of experience, and then our ambivalence about what we pay and what we get. So I think it's absolutely. <laughs> but I mean, absolutely. I, I, so I think what it's you know at the end, there, there, it's really a play about the fact that there is no resolution in many ways. The minute you resolve one thing, you unresolve something else. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, and, and these things. I mean, I would be lying if I said I set out to write a play that explored these issues. I set out honestly. I was like, this character seems interesting to me. I want to find out about this character. And over the course of learning about the character through my own imagination, through books, and through the incredible collaboration of everybody else, going, wow, this is actually an amazing kind of character. I love, I love what you said about like this, this, this idea of these, of these characters for children's literature that are designed for like, like I can read this, I can be this someday, you know what I mean? And that's incredibly empowering. Um, and I found, I find the character be, to be very empowering. And, uh, but then as I, as, as I worked on the play and thought, and again thought about the, the sort of conceit of the play, of like, well, what do you do when you have a character who can do everything, except they're sort of inside this box, essentially, which is its own kind of contradiction. I mean, Nancy Drew has independent wealth and can kind of drive the car and go wherever she wants at any given time, but she just can't. She just can't grow up. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so what happens when when they? When they do, and, and so that that started making me ask questions about aging, and, and ultimately, to me, a question about identity. I mean, who does that make me? I mean, if you know, if Veronica very much identifies herself. I am this thing. I, I, am I? Am I some? Am I a thing, or am I what I do? And is there a difference? Can you even make that kind of distinction? And as I get older, that complicates that. And um, as she gets older, she can't do what she did before, though. 
Yeah, and that's where again because kind of sad. well, <laughs> it is kind of sad. It is kind of sad. I mean, there were versions of the play early on when I was where I said, well, uh, you know, she is going to do what she does. She's going to get a gun and she's going to go out and do this. And I thought that's a really kind of like a masculine kind of vision. I'm like it started to go like to Quentin Tarantino land. <laughs> 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 it's fiction in a minute. Well, yeah. I mean, she does show up with an eye patch, but, I, but, uh, but, but I, I, that just seemed. Not right, you know. Um, and then uh, again, I, I would be lying if I said I, 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 I thought about all this beforehand. You discover it, um, but you know, it was set in the '50s, so you kind of go, "What would she, be, uh, what would she be able to do?" Um, in many of the earlier discussions, people were like, "Well, does she want to go on and be a detective?" But it's like, "Well, yeah, but she wants to be the kind of detective that she was always was. She doesn't want to run out and be a hard-boiled detective." That. Because I tried writing that version of it, and it just it was wrong. I, I, so, so somehow it arrived at, at what what the play is now, which which does explore these these things of of aging. And, and, and again, for me, I, I really latched onto like it's the identity thing. It's like, well, well, who am I in this collection of things I did or things I want to do? I mean, where do I sit? And what I represent. I mean, she's it's so much about um, her role vis-a-vis -vis other people and how her role is appreciated by other people and her role as a daughter and then her role as yep. a wife and her role as a friend and her role as the hero of the town. Um, and that starts to really, I mean, one of the reasons that she can't do what she did is partly because it's not enough for her anymore either. Right. She begins to sort of push those envelopes. There was, I was thinking about this yesterday. I'm reading this book, which has nothing to do with this, on the um, 19th century writers and the way that um, uh, subversive reform writing influenced them. And so there are all these, I've been reading about all these examples of these books that were about anti-violence or anti-slavery, um, anti anti-prostitution, anti-drinking, and they all purport to be anti, but the whole book is a lascivious, luscious <laughs> description of what happens when those things happen. And then at the very end, which is of course really bad and we don't want it to happen. So, so it's like they get to have their cake and eat it too. And I thought of it last night in the scene where, because there are all these scenes where when she finally confronts the bad guy as the play goes on, and she begins to say, well, and, the, and the bad guys and everybody are saying, well, I'm not really, I'm not that bad. And, and then she's saying, but what if you were? And you know, what would you do? And so it reminded me sort of, and there's one where she actually goes into a description and gives a helpful description of what he might do or, yes. or what might happen. Yeah. Um, so, but it's also, and it, that made me think about that period when you read these, because I think that at the same time that, that she is heroic and independent and you want to kind of be like her, it's also that holding those two things, then it's very comforting because she settles it. She doesn't get killed. Well, she, well, we know what the mystery is. The mystery yes, is adolescence. Yes, yes, you know, the yes, mystery yes, is sex. Yes, I mean, it's the mystery of the, you know, old door or something, but what, do you, what is it you're looking to solve? Right. You know, you're looking yeah. to solve something you don't know about. Um, it, it's clear what the mystery is, but, but I think it's also, not to, I mean, that's a little crude, but it's also about who am I going to be? Yes. What's the mystery yeah. for adolescence is always, what's this going to lead to? Absolutely. Like, oh, when, when am I going to grow up and, yeah. and, and do all those and so mysterious, strange things? Here's a set of mysteries I can solve, and that, yeah. that gives you hope that maybe you'll be able to solve the others. Yeah. I, I get that. I do, I'm worried that she's all by herself in Maine in the end. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I, I, I could, I could give an answer to that. Absolutely. One of the things, though, that I'm sort of finding is that, is that I, I, especially as the play really took shape in the last week, is that I, I, I like that we created. A, and I'm, I'm just talking directly about the production now, but, uh, but, I, it's my hope that the audience is, 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 is asked to fill in that question, and, and in the way that it. That, that same thing in a mystery, what's going to happen next, what's going to happen next, I, I really want the audience to sew that in with clues that don't all quite add, add up. Um, and that's, that's my hope. I mean, I, can, I, can, I think it's a little, I think there's hope at the end. Okay. Uh, certainly. Um, especially because I, I think she has realized, and forgive me, I'm giving a spoiler alert. Uh, I, I, I think she's realized something, I think she's started to learn something and, and, and has the potential to move on. To, to something else. So for me, it is hopeful. But I know some people are like, it's so sad. It's, it's, and, uh, and it's also hard for me to watch the work at this point. Because you know what I mean? I see it. But, um, um, but again, the cost of experience, like if she didn't 
if what if that didn't happen, then she would be. I mean, you you see her become unhappy almost. I mean, there's this, the establishment of kind of how her life has been, and then almost immediately when, when she gets the plaque at the beginning, it's the 19th plaque of the 2,000 boxes of plaques in the house, and uh, that's to recognize her as a heroine, and it's kind of old. Um, yeah, absolutely. And she needs something new. Yeah, well, I understand she needs to move on. That that I, I thought that was that, yeah yeah I, yeah I hear that, and I understand that that you have to be unhappy. You know, this is the W. E. B. Du Bois thing in the Souls of Black Folk. Du Bois says is a little story in the middle of the book, and and the, the young man, young African American guy, goes off and studies and comes back to his hometown and is you know now more progressive racially than everybody else, and everybody hates him. And he's making trouble. His younger sister says to him. Uh, are you glad you went away to college? You're glad you learned this stuff. And he says, yes. And she says, why? You're so unhappy. And he says, well, it's better to be unhappy and know, uh, which is sort of the adolescent question. It's better to be unhappy and know something uh, than to be always innocent. That's, that's not good either, I understand. Proust yeah. the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that counts. <laughs> And he says that quite a lot, though. <laughs> Unhappiness is the key. Unhappiness is the key to learning. Yeah. Well, you know, we. I'm sorry, thinking about this. She ends up maimed at the end, and I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, in in, in a large way, a, a lot of the play is is so open to interpretation, hopefully in the right kind of way, because people are like, What's, it can be so many metaphors. I mean, people have had different discussions about what that what that may, may mean. To me, I always, I, I'm I'm a very literal minded person. I think in some ways, like. Veronica, Mellis, that, that, you know, you take things uh, as they as they are, um, and to me, that's that's just sort of the it's just a way to show the accumulation of what you've it's gone through, not to destroy yeah. at all. In fact, Angela, who who many of you know, plays Veronica Mellis, and one early draft, she said, "What she she loses her eye and, <laughs> and she said she she's just beaten and broken." And I'm like, I'm like, in, like I'm like confounded. I'm like, no, are you kidding? It's a happy ending. <laughs> Watch this this person go down who doesn't learn, and I said, "Well, that's easy. I mean, I think what's harder, what's a hundred thousand times harder, is that what do you do after you hit the bottom? What do you do? Work at the library. Put on an iPad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I know. I know. I know. There are worse things than working at the library. Just that's <laughs> Again, just to, not to not to completely destroy the clay, but but the movement from do you want corn chips? Do you want corn chips? Do you want corn chips? Do do you want tuna salad? Do you want macaroni salad? Do you want two other kinds of salad? Yeah. 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 I think we should be there. You will be. Um, so I think we should open it up sure. now. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Um, anybody have a question, Melanie? Uh, Stephen, you uh, talked about um, that you first named the character Vivian, and you said you would talk later on about why you named her oh. Veronica, so oh, yes, I'm hanging on your every word. Oh, uh, no. Uh, I named her Vivian originally, and then uh, this is before any of our children were born. So we have a, a son, Dashiell, and a daughter who we named Vivian. Um, again, I put this, when I worked on this, I put it in a drawer and didn't even literally forgot about it. Or I, If you can actually do that, it must have existed somewhere. Proust uh, would say that. No. Nope. <laughs> uh, uh, and so when I looked back at it and I started, I, I knew I wanted to try to work on it. I said, well, I can't name her Vivian because I'll just think about my daughter, which is a good thing to think about, but I, I you know, I needed to. But I didn't want her in an eye patch. No, I didn't at all. Yes. I did. Although we're working at the library. Yeah, at one point I said, is this a play about what, how I feel about my daughter? And it's like, it's like, no, I uh, Next, I'll just live that part. There were a lot of funny names for Nancy Drew before she got to be Nancy Drew. Oh, it was Stella. That one Stella. I remember, but I Stella. remember. Stella. Yeah. yeah. Stella. I know. It was yeah. before then, so, you know, it would have had a different... I, I I've never seen the, the Veronica Mars TV series. I, I hear that it's quite good, and I know they just did one of those Kickstarter things and actually made a movie of it. Um, Backer. What's that? Are you a backer? Yeah. So I haven't seen it, but I hear it's it's quite it's quite good. Fantastic. 
So this is Amy Eller Lewis, who works with me at the Athenaeum and is a great uh, fan of Girl Detectives and all of our super obsessed Nancy Drew. Super obsessed Nancy Drew. I'm in charge also at the library, which I know is the ultimate spinster retiring job. Um, but I am happily married and completely normal. I have both my hands. <laughs> my, uh, one of my jobs at the Athenaeum is um, the, it's not officially called this, but unofficially they're called the Nancy Drew Files. And there are sheets that contain books that have been lost. We know they're in the library somewhere, mm -hmm. but they haven't been checked out. Somebody has taken them off the shelf and put it back themselves, which you should not do. You should bring those back to us. Um, and I am the official Nancy Drew of the Athenaeum. I'm the one who is in charge of that. And I just like to find that usually the first thing is they come to me and say, did you take another book? I do. I do. <laughs> Did you have Nancy Drew books in uh, your collection? We certainly do. We have. Uh, we don't have like Nancy Drew files, Nancy Drew books, because we don't have those. We have the straight up yellow Nancy Drews. We also have, not all of them, but about seven or eight of the Applewood uh, mm -hmm. simile editions, which are really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I would like to point out that in the early, uh, specifically the Mildred Ward Benson books, she has a gun, you guys. Yeah. She has a gun. She carries a gun. She drives an unsafe family. She does not trust policemen. I love that about her. She yeah. doesn't trust cops. And anybody who says, you know, well, if you've read one Nancy Drew, you can predict any plot twist, whatever. Really? Can ones. you predict, I don't know, let's see, the counterfeit operation that the cover for the counterfeit operation was that they were a nudist cult? <laughs> <laughs> As iconography, almost, and I play the Nancy Drew games. I'm wearing a Nancy Drew T-shirt, signed with twisted candles, original Russell Tandy illustration. We're out there. But one of the things that was so important about it to me is that that it wasn't just that she was the girl detective; that she was the only girl. Yeah. She was the only girl. There was no Hunger Games, guys. There was no. Oh, right, right. There were other series, and there were this one. There were some, but, but by and large, the girl characters in books were girl detectives. Uh, I don't remember a lot of because all of the adventure books, those were all boy books. Those were all Tom Sawyer and just Treasure Island. And those were all boys. And from my adolescence, or from my my youth, probably I, I I fell off of Nancy Drew in adolescence. You become too cool for Nancy Drew very quickly. And then I find you turn back to her in your thirties. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, there are some things that you know, a long hot stove, this much scotch and coffee cup, and, all <laughs> and there's a lot. <laughs> but what do you think is such an important part of, of, of her effect on culture, at least for me, is something that I believe you were saying about the the mystery is is us. Yeah. The mystery is is who. Who are we? And the ones that I read, it turns out, were the old ones. I have a friend, um, Kieran, who collects these, and he says, uh, Oh, he was here last night. Oh, bless him. Uh, he's also a Nancy Drew collector. And I like What color was her <laughs> shoes? Yeah. It's how you can tell. It tells you how, uh, what you were yeah. when you, blue they changed the color. So, they changed the color. And they changed blue. you when I read them. When was the... When that was after the 316. Yeah. 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 Yes. And it's actually been interesting. Listen, I think especially listening to you talk about the, the history because I read Nancy Drew as a child, but then I graduated very quickly to Turing. Turing, I like Turing. Oh, yeah, Turing. 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 And I was thinking what you were talking about, why that appealed to me. She was a professional. Yeah. And she was a student nurse. She went immediately. And yep. She changed a little. Of course, yeah. you, know, you don't question the fact that she changed jobs twice a year. Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. how many yeah. mysteries there were in that hospital. But that's <laughs> just. Well, that's why <laughs> Terry Ames jungle nurse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> over and yeah. over again. Yeah. I mean, Terry Ames student ranch nurse is special. <laughs> there you are. But, um, but because she had a career. You know, she had, yeah. and for me, that was more appealing right. than Nancy. Nancy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, there was a rich. There was also Vicky Barr, who was a flight stewardess, but she also knew how to fly planes right. and fix them. Uh, <laughs> well, there was, Stratmeyer had, a, had several series. One was called The Motor Boys, which was very 
popular, and then there were the Moto Girls. Um, so these were in the 30s. You could actually buy books about girls who knew how to fix their own cars and travel across country and stuff. So there are a bunch of those. I have to say, I, I wandered out, my student Mark Hanson was here, today, and I wandered out into intermission, and, and every woman in the place was talking about things they do. Uh, you know, they were to, Yes. You know, when did you read them? How did you read them? And I, I think that goes back to something we were saying that, in fact, it was it, these popular culture forms are communal. Uh, that that they matter because you read them in a group, you read yes. them together, yes. and now you have the stories to tell each other. And it, and it's about identity. It's about your own life and and how you connected and when you connected. And so the stories I have to say the stories in the intermission in the lobby are are, are really good. <laughs> If you want to write the second version. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Steve? Yeah, I, I'm very interested in the idea of the early Nancy Drew and the feminist or proto-feminist. And I guess the question I'd like to ask is, if, if one were to compare the early Nancy Drew and say the, the early Hardy Boys, which right. I do know, I don't know the Nancy Drew books, would you find uh, similar mechanisms of thought? Or would you find different kind of expert knowledge applied? What I'm getting at is, you know, are there any moments when knowing how to sew a button or bake a cake, which a girl of that time might be expected to know and a boy might not be expected to know, become plot elements? I, I haven't read these myself, but the PhD students at Brown tell me that the super mysteries are where you see that, that she brings the girl, the woman's point of view and they bring the man's point of view, so she has the hair clips and the, and the baking knowledge and they have the... But but in the in the original books, you know, men never have women's um, skills, but the girls have both. Uh, so she had both. She could fix the roadster. She didn't need a boyfriend. Um, and when she gets stuck on a lonely road, she could fix the roadster. And she had, uh, and, and you do some of that. You know, they, they, they she pulls around and pulls out the bobby pin and, and opens the. Um, and she always has food, and she, you know, so there's, there's a, she, she gets to be both in touch with both her male and uh, her, her masculine and feminine sides. The Hardy Boys, not so much. <laughs> Great. Yes. I uh, looked at some of my old Nancy Drew books, oh, maybe 40 years after I read them, and I remember back then thinking that, and being interested by the fact that there was the emphasis on what Nancy was wearing. Yes. So this really would be quite different. So this is the girl versus the boy. Right. This is the culture. Change, changed a bit over time, I think. Um, so the, one of the, the, the continuing plot points is that uh, Nancy and George don't care much about what they wear, but Bess does, and she's always on them to wear better clothes. Um, and this one um, from Ocean State Job Lots is um, called Dress to Steal, and, it, and it's about a dress shop that's opened in Riverdale that is a young hip designer, and um, Nancy decides she needs better clothes because she's gone to her father's. Uh, uh, he's gotten an award, and and she and and George are badly dressed, and Bess looks good. So they're going. She and George go out shopping. So I, my feeling is there's more shopping as an activity in the later books. Um, shopping, but I. And she always just had the clothes in the earlier. But books, and they're right? described in the books, so it's a cardigan sweater, matching color, the detail on the apparel, which I thought was interesting. There's also my memory is that. Um, Bess, who is the more, the most feminine of the three, and Nancy is somewhere sort of in between, is is also seen as kind of the less clever. Yes. Hmm. Always I eating. Just <laughs> yes. not kidding. Yes, no, that's, that's, that's true. true. That's also true. true. Yes. Yes. Let's not forget. And they're yes. and often teasing her about yes. that, mm -hmm. that, like, oh my gosh, you can have another donut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ah. But she's also the one with all the boyfriends. Hmm. She's chubby. Yes. Relevant, so. um, <laughs> um, I'm wondering about how the uh, how the meaning and the impact of Nancy Drew and the other girl detectives we've mentioned compare to that of women coming out of Agatha Christie and even of like Irene Adler in in the Conan Doyle books because in, in some ways they seem similar but in some ways they seem very different to me. Well, I, I, there's a, I was thinking when Susan was just talking about um, me or, and Stephen about me being able to fix things, there was a detective, a British detective that I loved, Albert Campion, and I can't remember who wrote Marjorie Allen. And she and his, is that the one where it's, it's him who, the, his, 
fiance, Amanda Fitton, and she is a pilot, and she can fix, yes. This is That's tremendously right. appealing. Um, and the, the, some of the stuff I've read compares um, the Nancy Duke books as modernist, um, um, uh, coming out of a modernist tradition, and they compare it to Dorothy Sayers' books, uh, the Peter Wimsey books, and they literally put sentences next to each other and say, see, you know, we, we now think of Sayers as a, as a great stylist, and, and, um, and that is an interesting, um, the gender roles and, um, and, and sexualities all in, in the, the Sayers novels. And, and so that this author, this literary critic, puts um, lines from you know, the Nancy Drew books next to the lines from the Peter Wimsey novels and says, oh, <laughs> look at this, the writing's the same. I didn't know about the woman characters. I don't know. Did you read a lot of mysteries? I didn't. Uh, I didn't. I, I, the only one that comes to mind is there's a P.D. James character, Cordelia Gray, yes, I think. Right. And in fact, I think the first time that character is introduced is an, an unsuitable job for a woman. That's right. um, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but speaking of mysteries, I, there were, I read these Kate Atkinson books. Uh, they're fantastic case, case histories. And um, there, was, uh, there were four of them. And the main detective in this man, Jackson Brody. But I, uh, Angela's a big, big mystery reader. She read tons and tons and tons. And I, I had never read a mystery book like those Kate Atkinson books where you where you were compelled to solve the mystery, not just to find out what happened, because there was a deep emotional need. Um, there's a child that's abducted in one, and, 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 and it, her books are amazing. I, I, I can't recommend them enough, but it was a, it really clicked for me about like, because sometimes, the stakes? yeah, what are the stakes? What is the need to solve the mystery versus just, it, it, it's not just an accomplishment. It's like, if, 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 if this is done, it will, it will make someone's life better or, or complete something in someone's life. They're incredibly compelling and different, and sad and violent um, and strange. Um, and I'm sure that that had an influence on, on, on my attraction to this particular thing. They're, they're really incredible books. And he's a great character, but all the characters in it are, are really, really great. I see the influence also in Sarah Grant's novels. Does anybody know uh, Claire DeWitt and City of the Dead? Uh, these are, are and I, you see a very direct and, and on purpose connection between Nancy Drew and, and Claire DeWitt. Because Claire DeWitt was a girl detective in her teens, and it's a kind of this idea of what happens to the real girl detective in the real world when the big mystery of her youth was not solved. The answer is she becomes the greatest detective in the world. She also kind of becomes a drug addict who hates herself. Uh, oh. And it, it, it's very dark in a, in a lot of ways and very noir. And I think that there is a a way that, that when Nancy, to me, if Nancy Drew meets the real world, she turns into Randy Chandler. Like that's, mm -hmm. and this, I do that's see a important. real connection with the Sarah Brand, but I think that it's probably more because the author was influenced by Nancy Drew rather than the character. Mm -hmm. That's my theory. But I would say that Sarah Brand would be a big connection. I do think the Veronica, uh, the, uh, uh, Veronica Mars is, and I haven't watched much of it, and I haven't seen the film yet, but so I'm going to just talk about it anyway. Um, is, is, is about is a little bit about this, you know, because the you know the the, the woman who played her grows up, and then so the movie has to take up later. You know, yeah. she's out of high school; she doesn't she's not going to solve all these high school mysteries. So so what do you do? So it, it's a it's a it's a good trope. It's a good question. But yeah, Robin yeah. Mars is as much noir as as she is Nancy Drew. She's as much Raymond Chandler. Uh, down to you know stained glass windows and working in the PI's office, and it's, it's definitely got that flavor. It has just as much to do with that as as it does you know, with the Carl, do you have a question? Yeah, I, I know you said okay. When I the play obviously giving it away has two acts, and at the end of the first act, I thought, what's going to happen next? You know, because she's going to grow up, and I immediately thought. Is this going to be like V.I. Vyshkovsky and Kinsey Malone and such like that? Because again, they're, to my mind, I've never read Nancy Drew or the Hardy Boys, or if I did, I don't remember it. But I definitely remember reading all of, I would say, the modern pot boiler um, PI novels that are all women. 
And they're also learners, very similar to, you know, Nancy Drew and stuff like that. But you, you said you weren't even tempted to try and go into that. Well, it, it did for a while, but it just, I don't know, it just didn't, you know, the way I craft plays in my tiny experience as a, as a playwright is to, to kind of write and then step back and go, well, where, I do ask what's going to happen next, or what would likely happen next, and then I try to follow that, and then I kind of back up and go, well, is that, I don't know, interesting, or does that feel right? It's very strange. It's just kind of, I work by feel a lot. Um, uh, there was, I, at one point, the first scene of the second act was, was her in a morgue looking at the body of one of the girl detectives who had been killed. And for quite a while in the drafts, all the girl detectives had just died. And, and everybody was like, what happened? Oh my god, who's killing them all? And, and, I, and to my mind, I'm like, they were just all, they just weren't all that good, so they just died kind of really dumbly. And I thought it was really funny, and everybody was like, this is not <laughs> um, I thought, this, this is not so funny. Like, you know, they're all, they're all just it's not as good as her, so they, they just kind of, you know, feel over. Um, and I tried following that for a while, and all it did was lead me into a, a, a much darker place. I know the play does get darker, but it, into a, and, and a different kind of, into that kind of thing, where it's going to be, oh, it's going to be lots of shooting and people, you know, serial killers and stuff like that. Uh, and and it, that, I don't know, I just, that didn't feel right. You, your play certainly, in the second act, asks a lot more questions than I would expect either V.I. or Kinsey Malone to solve. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, there, I mean, the questions that are asked are not questions that can be solved by solving the... Yeah. You know, you find the tiara and you still That's have right. questions. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I think yeah. we have time for one more, Steve. Yeah. yeah, I just, I think you're all reminding us that in these detective stories, there has to be something at risk. So something has to be threatened or there has to be some, some potential for loss there. I was thinking a couple of things. One is, is it useful to think of the Alice in Alice in Wonderland as a real detective? Mm -hmm. I think it might be. But the other, I guess the other question is, um, um, you know, if the, ri if the risk isn't real, then who would believe the story? So I think you, you were probably quite right to put, you know, to put your imagination in these dark places because yeah. otherwise who cares? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, 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 there has to be, again, because it's, it's writing a play, I mean, there needs to be conflict and consequences to actions and then the characters either deal with them or they don't deal with them. There needs to be a, a, a world in which consequences can happen. I mean, it starts off essentially in a world where there are consequences, but they are they are known and they're there. You can you can put your hands around them, and and so as it goes on, wanting to make wanting to keep expanding that. So it's like, uh, do you keep going forward or do you change your course? Because these consequences are uh, I can't handle I can't handle them. I can't. I can't think of them in the same way that I used to. Um, yeah. One more. Go ahead. Well, it's not really a question, but when you're talking about Nancy Drew, there's one thing you forgot. They had made that into a television series in the 1970s with Pamela Sue Martin, where they were paired off with, where she was paired off with the Hardy Boys. Sean Cassidy. Right. Big Sean. Sean Parker Stevenson. Parker Stevenson. Yeah, I knew them. Um, the, and there are three movies as well from yeah. earlier on. But I, I think I haven't seen the movies, but I, I kind of like the movies. Did you saw the movies? Yeah, one. 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 Yeah. All right, let's give them a nice round of applause. that haven't seen the show, uh, uh, please feel free to come by. Uh, you can buy tickets on our website. And then also there are some really great um, sort of uh, fake uh, Veronica Meadows uh, book covers that RISD students did that are on the, on the wall up here. You should really check them out. They're beautiful and funny and, and great. Uh, and thank you so much for coming as always. See you. Thank you. Thank you.